you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Continuing our study of the Gospel of John. Verses 1 through 44 is the balance of the text we will consider. I'm not going to read it all at one time. Um, There are times I have rather lengthy scripture readings. Uh, This morning I feel it is more appropriate to read it in part as we work our way through this story and for me to tell you the story. Um, Simply, this is a story of how Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And the narrative of John's gospel, this is what we call the last sign of Jesus. Jesus did a variety of signs and wonders. And we've looked at five of them, or four of them, I think. Turning the water into wine. We looked at Jesus doing, healing the man at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, the feeding of the 5,000. And then we also looked at um, a variety of others. And this morning we're going to look at the death and resurrection of Lazarus. Bobby, you'll turn his pulpit mic down just a hair. Uh, As we um, come into this story, this is what we know as the last of seven signs that John gives us to point to us who Jesus is and to show us who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And so um, they are here to demonstrate the glory and the majesty of Jesus. Remember, John's goal is for us to understand that this is God himself. And his goal was for us to understand that Jesus is the word made flesh. This is the seventh sign. It is the story of how Martha and Mary send word to Jesus. Lazarus is Jesus' good friend, as are Mary and Martha. He sends word to Jesus, or they send word to Jesus, that Lazarus, their beloved brother, Jesus' beloved friend, is sick. And Jesus remains where he is for two days, longer than, when he, than he should have, perhaps, based upon their timeline. He doesn't come right away. He stays where he is for two days. He remains, when he first finally gets to Bethany, he finds out that Jesus has died. I mean, Lazarus has died. Lazarus has died. He's been in the grave for four days. Martha comes out and meets Jesus and says, Jesus, if if you had only been here, you could have done something to prevent my brother from dying, the one you love from dying. But nevertheless, I believe that you are the Lord of glory and whatever you do will be done. Mary comes out and is overcome with grief and weeping and in pain and she just simply hugs the Lord Jesus Christ and they meet on the outside of the town of Bethany which is about two miles east of Jerusalem and then Jesus moved with compassion weeps by the tomb of Lazarus as they get to that tomb Jesus prays and says father I know you always hear me but I pray this prayer publicly on their benefit so they may know that you hear me and answer my prayers. And then he calls Lazarus to come out of the tomb after they roll the stone away. And when they roll the stone away, he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb. This is a sign to show the power of God. The seven signs progressively get more and more intense and more and more dramatic in John's gospel as he is revealing to us more and more of who Jesus Christ is. But also, this is a sign that is the preview of Jesus' own resurrection. We'll look at chapter 12 next week briefly as Mary anoints Jesus prior to his entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Then Palm Sunday, the 2nd of April, we'll dive into John's account of Palm Sunday. And everybody comes out because they'd heard about what Jesus had done for Lazarus. And they have this great throng of people and then he enters Jerusalem and he spends the last week of his life. And the end of chapter 12 all the way to chapter 21 really has to do with the last week of Jesus' life. Death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the book of signs comes to an end. We commonly know as the book of signs, chapters 1 through 12, comes to an end. And the book of glory takes over from there where we see the glory of Christ on full display in his cross and his resurrection. So this sign is a preview of that which is to come. Without further ado, let me pray for us and let's jump into the text. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We do ask that you will speak to us from this passage, encourage our hearts and strengthen it in accordance with your will. We ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord, speak so I decrease and you increase. Hide me behind the cross, for it is in Christ we pray. Amen. So the main theme for us from the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead is simply this, nothing is impossible with God because God majors or God specializes in the impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. God specializes in doing the impossible. 
Why is this important to us? Well, every one of us finds ourselves regularly in a situation that is fundamentally impossible. You say, well, Clint, everything seems to be going pretty well in my life, and I can't think back to a time when I found myself in an impossible situation. And I, we give God praise if that's your testimony this morning. There are those of us who are currently walking through impossible situations, impossible difficulties, impossible challenges. And we need some encouragement from God, and this passage will speak directly to us. But this speaks, passage speaks not just to those who are currently walking through those, paths, those, those difficult challenges and seemingly impossible situations. It speaks to every one of us, for every one of us is, by, by virtue of our being born into sin, in an impossible situation. Lazarus will die in this story. Every one of us will die. There's only been two who have not died in the history of man that we know of with reference to the scriptures. The first was Enoch. In Genesis chapter 5, Enoch walked with God and was no more. And the second was Elijah. And Elijah was carried up on, uh, by, uh, in a chariot of fire in heaven. He was walking with God and all of a sudden he gets in this chariot of fire and goes into heaven. Everyone else who's ever walked the face of the earth has died. Death is the ultimate outcome for every one of us in our physical sense. We will all die. It is undefeated. Lazarus dies. You are going to die. I am going to die. And the impossible situation in which you find yourself is twofold. Number one, you're going to die and there's nothing you can do about it. We can try to extend our lives as much as we can. We can talk about how we can find different ways in which we are going to um, extend our lives with good medical treatment and we give God praise for all of those different things. But ultimately, all of us will die should the Lord tarry and not return. If he decides to come back in our lifetime, then praise God. But outside of that, we will die. That is an impossible situation. You can do nothing about it. It's the great equalizer of life. Why do we die? Well, we die because of the curse on sin, for we've all sinned. And so the fact that we need life after death is an impossible situation. You can't earn it, you can't create it, you can't do it because you have sinned just like Adam and Eve sinned, just like everyone who's ever walked on the face of the earth has sinned except for the Lord Jesus Christ. So life after death is impossible for us and salvation Eternal salvation in the presence of God is impossible for each one of us. So every one of us finds ourselves in an impossible situation. And yet, our God majors in overcoming the impossible. He majors, he specializes in overcoming the impossible. Now that you know the main theme and why it matters. Let's dive into this story. I'm going to divide this story into three parts. I don't always do this, but I think it's appropriate to do it this morning. I'm going to divide it into three parts. First of all, I'm going to call it the impossibility of God's delay. Second of all, I'm going to call it the impossibility of God's solution. And third, excuse me, secondly, it's the impossibility of God's comfort. And third is the impossibility of God's solution. The impossibility of God's delay, the impossibility of God's comfort, and the impossibility of God's solution to the problem that is impossible in our lives. Let's get started. The delay of God. The impossibility of God's delay. Let's first one. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he had heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now I'm going to pause right there for a moment and get, make sure you understand what John is telling us regarding this situation. We are told that Jesus loves Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. He loves them dearly and deeply. Lazarus is ill, and Jesus says to his disciples, when he gets word that Lazarus is ill, Jesus says to his disciples, and this is important, Jesus says, this illness does not lead in death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus categorically, and we'll come back to this, but Jesus categorically says, this illness does not lead to death. Now, Jesus, we're told, verse 5, loved Martha and Mary. And so when word gets to him that Lazarus is ill, he stays where he stays for two days longer. Now, he's in the place, and he stays where he is for two days before he makes the journey to be at Lazarus' side. 
And I always find this passage and this, this story difficult. And the reason I find it difficult is because of my impatient heart, but also because of the culture in which I live and the culture in which you live. And that's because we expect Jesus to run to our aid immediately. I have a need. And I need that to need to be met immediately. And Jesus, if you're any God at all and you love me at all, you will come to my aid immediately. We are controlled by the tyranny of the moment, by the tyranny of the immediate. In this particular case, though, we are told that Jesus intentionally stays where he is for two more days. He intentionally delays his coming to the aid of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Now, I don't know, you're probably familiar with the story, so maybe it doesn't strike you as odd, but as I read that, it seems very, very out of character. Because if you love someone, you think about someone in your own life, you think about the situation perhaps in your own life, if you love someone, you're going to run to meet their need. A parent sees a child fall. You get up and go and see what's happening with the child. You have a friend call you and say, I'm in a terrible bind. You get up and immediately, if possible, and go see if you can meet that need. That's how we respond. Because, after all, our heartstrings are being tugged. And in this particular case, Jesus does the opposite. Jesus delays. Why? Because he is intentionally waiting to go be with them... And at this early stage in the story, we are told so that the situation will develop to the point that his glory will be revealed. You need to understand, I need to understand, when we think about our relationship with God, when we think about our crying out to God and our need for him to come to us and meet us where we are, sometimes God intentionally delays so that the situation will get to the point where his glory is most fully revealed. You need to understand, this is what God's purpose in life is. God's purpose is not to make Clint happy. God's purpose is to reveal his glory. A byproduct of him revealing his glory in Clint's life is Clint is often happy in the Lord. But his ultimate purpose is to bring glory to his name. And so God works all things according to the power of his holy will in his holy timing to accomplish his glory and the revelation of his glory on the earth, the display of his majesty, the display of his character on earth among men. And sometimes that necessarily means that he delays when coming to meet us where we are. Doesn't make it any easier necessarily, but it means that he delays. Jesus says this does not lead to death. But then we pick this story up in verse, if we continue on verse 11, Jesus has this interaction with his disciples and then they're like, why, have you, why are you delaying? Well, let's go to Judea, right? And, and, and then he says, you know, he delays and he's like, let's go. And they say, you can't go. Somebody's going to try to kill you. And Jesus says this, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And the disciples trying to keep Jesus from going close to Jerusalem says, well, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. That's what he needs. And Jesus had spoken of his death. But they thought that he meant his taking rest in sleep. Jesus says he wasn't going to die. Now Jesus says he died. Hold on to that thought. You may be wondering, what in the world? How do I make sense of that? Hold on to that thought. The impossibility of God's delay. God often delays to set the situation to where it's impossible so that we can fully rely upon him and his glory will be most fully displayed. Continuing on in the story, the impossibility of God's comfort. So as Jesus arrives in town, verse 17, we're told this. Now when Jesus came to Bethany, which is east of Jerusalem, he finally came. He found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So Lazarus had died, he had been embalmed, and then he'd been put in the tomb. Or maybe not embalmed, but put directly in the tomb. There's disparity of what that meant. But the reality of it was he had been in the tomb for four days. The emphasis on four days is important because it means he was as good and dead. He was good and dead. There was no question about the fact this man had been dead. These sisters were distraught. Verse 14, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Verse 14. 19 says this, 
And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. People had come and they'd brought their casseroles. They'd come to sit around the table and encourage one another, build each other up. Verse 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she heard that Jesus was coming, she ran out of the house to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if your brother had been here, my brother would not, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask him from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Important note about Martha here. Now, Martha maintains her faith. She's angry. She's frustrated. She's hurting. And I think if we're not careful, we can read this story in a benign way. We can read this story kind of emotionless. But if we think about it for a moment and we dive into it, we kind of put ourselves where Martha is. We know, as Joshua said there in the children's sermon, we get upset when someone dies. She had sent word for Jesus. Come and be with us. Most likely they knew where Jesus was, and most likely they knew how long it would take for Jesus to get where he was to where they were. They understood, I believe, that Jesus delayed. And if they didn't understand it, most likely somebody would have told them, we delayed in coming two days. I believe when Martha gets there that this is not just some, hey, Jesus, had you been here, things would have not been this way. I believe she's crying. I believe she's yelling. I believe she's pushing away. I believe she's maybe even beating him on the chest because she is distraught over the death of her brother, as would you be. The, the, the shock of this man died and Jesus wasn't here. You could have been here. Why weren't you here? You can see it playing out. She hasn't lost her faith. She says, even now I know whatever you ask of God, he will give you. She says, I know you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But in her pain, she is angry. She is frustrated. She is hurting. She needs consolation. And I believe the scene is more like Jesus embracing her, holding her as she's trying to push away. And he is just holding her until she submits and starts crying on his chest. I can see it happening that way. Because I've been around people who've lost loved ones. And I've been around people who had reason in their minds to be angry with God. Because he delayed or didn't meet their needs when they cried out to him. And so there is a frustration that comes out naturally. It's the beauty of these narratives. We're 2,000 years removed from this story. A lot has changed, but the reality of it is we still lose loved ones. The reality of it is, is we still have emotional pain and emotional hardship and we're probably more like them now than perhaps we were 25, 30 years ago because they weren't stoic the way perhaps we were as a people up until recent years. They were a very emotional people. People had come to cry and to wail and to moan and to grieve with these two women. She meets Jesus and Jesus gives a word of encouragement he will rise again. I know he will. In the last day, but he's gone now. I am the resurrection and the life. He who lives and believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. There's no indication he's going to bring him back at this moment. He's talking about life into the future. Life after death, that impossible reality that God gives us life after death by his grace. She believes, but she's in pain. When she had said this, verse 28 says, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and calling for you. Now Jesus says, go get your sister Mary. We have a Jesus embracing Martha. Now we have Jesus asking to speak to Mary. Mary's different than Martha. She's more reserved. She's more uh, introverted. She's more uh, uh, she, she's more. She thinks more about uh, reflective is the word I'm looking for than Martha. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and she went to him. And Jesus had not yet come into the village. She's still outside the village. But he was still where Martha had met him. When the Jews were with her, they rose and they were consoling her. They saw, they rose and went out. And they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to the 
to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. Here's another one. She falls at his feet. Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Here's the grief coming out again. If you had only been here, my brother would not have died. She has got the same expression. She's got the same pain. She's got the same situation as Martha. And Jesus is able to take it, the impossibility of the comfort of God. How can God comfort them in the midst of this? She's just lost her brother. Comfort seems so far away. And yet verse 33 says that when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And when Jesus gets to the tomb, Jesus weeps. Why does Jesus weep? Is it because he feels sorrow for Lazarus? Perhaps, but I don't read it that way. I did until this week. Now I read it when you look at verse 33. When he saw her weeping, when he saw the Jews weeping with her, he was deeply moved in the spirit, greatly troubled. He asked where they laid him. They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then he weeps, not because of Lazarus, who has, by the way, gone to be with the Lord. He was a man of faith. Jesus doesn't weep after the death of his saints. He welcomes them into his kingdom. He's weeping in compassion for these two women and for all of those there grieving by the tomb of Lazarus. This is the impossibility of God's comfort that when we are in our worst situation in the greatest and direst of straits and we're crying out before God, he has compassion on us and meets us where we are and empathetically cries alongside of us. God has sympathy for the brokenhearted. We see it in the person of Jesus. The delay. The pain and the suffering for the women. But notice there's not a regret from Jesus that he delayed his coming. See, if Jesus had come when he was initially called, he could have saved all this grief. That's what Mary and Martha are saying to him. If you had just showed up when it was when we called for you, you could have saved all of this stuff. But notice Jesus doesn't weep because he's sorrowful, sorrowful for the reason, for the delay in coming to meet them. Whereas you and I might be sorrowful in a moment where we have maybe messed up or we didn't meet someone's needs immediately and we feel bad about that. There's no feeling bad here for Jesus. Jesus feels bad for them in their grief, but not for his delay. Why? Because it is for the glory of God to be, dis to be displayed. And it is far better for us to experience the display of the glory of God in the impossible situations than for Jesus to keep us out of the those impossible situations. It is better for Lazarus to have died. It is better for them to have grieved. It is better for them to have walked this walk of pain and suffering and to meet him where he is and then him to raise Lazarus from the dead than for Jesus to show up and keep Lazarus from dying. You need to hear that this morning. I need to hear that this morning. Because what we get mad at God about is not meeting us and keeping us from going through that. And sometimes the very thing we need is to go through that so we can see the glory of God on the backside. And had they not gone through that moment of pain and suffering and watching him die, they would have never come to that last section, the impossibility of God's solution, and to see Jesus pray to the Father in heaven, Father, I know that you always hear me, but I pray on their benefit. So that they will know you hear my prayer and you answer them. And then hear him yell, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus walk out of the tomb, bound. And he says, unbind him and let him go. And this man is fully restored. Had Jesus kept him from dying, it would have been awesome. But it won't compare to the glory of God and the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. You need to understand that this morning. God majors in the impossible. He puts us through the impossible so that we can see the glory of God on full display. And so as we bring this to a conclusion, I think there are four areas that we can identify with those in this story. And sometimes we need to find ourselves in one of these four places, maybe multiple. First of all, 
we can find ourselves on the backside of the timing of God. We've cried out, 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 and yet God seems to not want to move. Where are you, God? And sometimes he intentionally is delaying us to put us in a situation that calls us faith and to trust in him. And so we find ourselves on the backside of God's timing and we long for where he is. The call on our lives is to have faith, trusting that God is always going to do things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. So the revelation of his glory is supremely important to God. It is the most important thing to God. It is the reason for which you and I were created and the reason for which we exist and the reason for which we have been saved. So we have to trust him that the revelation of his glory is good even though it may not always feel that way. So maybe God's delaying in your life right now. Some of us maybe find ourselves in a situation where we need to find the comfort of God and his compassion in our trials. If you had taken this trial away from me, God, I, I would never need this comfort. And maybe God says, no, the one thing you need to do is find out how gracious and loving and compassionate and caring I am. And so I'm going to put you through that impossible trial so I can reach out and comfort you in the midst of that trial. In the midst of that impossible situation. Maybe that's where you are this morning. We need to know that God comforts the brokenhearted. He is always near to the faint-hearted. He is though He is the God who is there to meet and bless those who mourn. Some of us need to realize that, in the midst of that, that God is bringing resurrection to His people ultimately, and He can fix through His resurrection power. He can fix the impossible situations that you're in. If you trust him and walk with him, you've just got to maintain that faithfulness and trust him in his time. So he's, got, he's put you through a delay. He's going to meet you where you are. And now he's got you in that impossible situation. He's about to bring an impossible solution. And you need to recognize that. And this is a forerunner, a foretaste, a preview, if it were, of his own resurrection. And so your ultimate impossible situation is life after death. Your ultimate impossible situation is salvation from your sins. And God has accomplished that already in Jesus. And so we need to trust him to do all other things in accordance with his will. He can bring forth a Lazarus from the grave. He can raise me on the last day. But he also can overcome anything in my life that I consider to be impossible. I've got to trust him to do it. But the fourth one's an interesting one. And I think one of the areas where we don't talk about God a whole lot working in our lives. But I think it's important. You may be in a situation in this story where you're Lazarus. And think about this. Lazarus has died. Now we believe the Old Testament tells us that because Lazarus believed in the promise of God he was going to send the Messiah. And Lazarus obviously had a relationship with Jesus. Like Martha believed that Jesus is the Christ, and Jesus loved Lazarus, and Lazarus loved Jesus. We believe the scriptures teach us that he went to be with the Lord. Lazarus had died. He had rested from his labors. He died in faith. He was at home with the Lord, just like our brothers and sisters in Christ who have died before us after the resurrection of Jesus. They were just saved in the promise of the resurrection, belief, through belief in the promise of the resurrection. But Jesus, though he had not died yet, had already accomplished their salvation because when God promises something, he guarantees it. Lazarus is at home with the Lord. He's resting. He's at peace. He's in a state of righteousness. His body's in a tomb, but his soul's at home with the Lord. And God goes to Lazarus and says, All right, Lazarus, you've got to walk out of heaven, and you've got to go back to earth. Man, what a raw deal Lazarus got. And God pulls his spirit, brings it back to his body, and brings life, and he comes out of the tomb. That's a raw deal when you think about it. But it was intentional and it was necessary for the revelation of the glory of God. And sometimes you may find yourself in a situation where you think, you know what? I don't understand why I've got to go through this to help benefit someone else who's weaker off or some other reason. And the reality of it is, is that God has called you to take upon that burden, to die to self, to live to the glory of God. So be the one through whom he reveals his glory to the world. 
And you can be assured of this. There's tremendous reward. Lazarus got to spend more time with Mary and Martha. Lazarus got to go into Jerusalem with Jesus on Palm Sunday. Lazarus got to spend time with Jesus between now and his death. Lazarus got to see the death of the Savior in whom he hoped. Lazarus got to be there during that time of darkness on that silent Friday or silent Saturday. And then Lazarus got to hit the news on Sunday morning that Jesus had risen from the dead. And then most likely Lazarus got to see a resurrected Jesus. He had to endure the change from glory to earth. But he got to see the glory of God. He got to participate in the glory of God. And then as he died again, he goes back into heaven and be with the glory of God. And maybe that's where you are this morning. Maybe that's where we are. We're in different places. But this story is powerful because it tells us that God majors in the impossible. For it is... In the impossible, where the glory of God is most clearly displayed to his people and on this earth. And the wonder of the majesty of his love and grace is seen most fully. May God be praised in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.